Welcome to the Branding Suite week six, or if you're in the quad semester, uh, we are in week three. Um, so we just kind of follow the balancing ball. So today we're going to continue on, um, and we're going to talk about the six environmental forces. Uh, specifically, um, we are just going to focus on uh, demographic, competitive, and, and regulatory. There are six, so let's look at those now. Actually, there's a quick way that I'm going to have uh, you guys help remember the six forces. Um, what is your favorite toothpaste? So mine is Crest toothpaste um, so it's an easy way to remember uh, what kind of toothpaste I like and because there's a D in front of it that's for me <clears throat> oops so the D uh, is the exception to the D crest but if you can remember it that's my name um, so that's a good way to remember so D crest um, but we are going to focus on the first three uh, but let's look at what they all stand for specifically so we can get a good idea. So here we go. Uh, move this down. So today, uh, like I said, we are going to talk about the D. So we're going to talk about the demographic. And then we are going to look at competitive. And with some of these, I have videos. I have my own YouTube channel. So we're going to watch me watching our, my own videos, but you can also please follow me on YouTube if you want, and I have the videos there as well. Um, you don't need to use this video, so it's uh, another way to watch. And the last one we're going to do today is regulatory. So let's uh, get right into it. I uh, have my video right here, me looking at me. Um, and uh, yeah, like I said, these are on, um, on uh, YouTube. Um, you can uh, find these videos, the full length. Some of these are cropped for, to more suited for this class, uh, but you can see the full videos if you like. Um, they're under uh, the marketing uh, playlist. All right, so let's uh, watch me watching me. <laughs> All right, here we go. And then we'll talk about it. So let's first one we're going to talk about is demographic forces. Let's look at that. Hey guys, uh, welcome back. Um, hope everyone is doing well. Uh, so this will be the first of a few videos that I'll be posting on this website, and you'll be able to follow the links on D2L. So remember, these are taken uh, we'll from my YouTube. So you we're just disregard uh, any comments with regards to quizzes uh, or anything like that. We'll talk about it. Done, we'll just I've talk about demographics on D2L. So you can follow that link and do that as many times as you want. Um, I did not so do a kahoot for you guys. So we're going to get going here and uh, hopefully you enjoy this. If there's any questions or feedback about the videos, please, by all means, uh, send me an email or uh, post a comment. Uh, that'd be great. All right. Okay. So uh, now that we are up and rolling, um, I want to make sure uh, you guys grab a uh, pen, a uh, piece of paper, um, just something to jot some notes down because we'll be doing a little bit of exercises maybe through this. Uh, it also may help from a studying perspective to make things going. So, uh, always a good option. If you want to pause the video right now for a quick second, and then go grab a pen and paper. Uh, we'll wait. Freeze frame. Okay. And break. So now you're back. <laughs> um, that's fantastic. Um, so one of the few things I want to help you, I like, I'm, you know, I'm always big on acronyms. Um, I am big on acronyms. Things, uh, allow you to remind you easier down the road. Um, so I want you to write down, grab a, your your pen. Um, and just write down um, your favorite toothpaste. Think about it. Okay, good. So the toothpaste I've been using for a lot of time is Crest. Um, Crest, I've used it for years. Um, but the coolest thing is that it actually ties into uh, helping us remember our acronym for all the environmental forces that in fact affect marketing, um, and we're going to be looking at those today. Okay. Okay, so 
changed uh, it a little bit. Here's, uh, like I mentioned about my favorite two faces. It was Crest D. Um, I changed it to really D Crest. Cool acronym to help remember. So as you can see, uh, you got uh, C R E S T, which is just the Crest. Um, but it's always hard to figure out what's, well, what do we use the D? How are we going to remember the D? Well, you know, my first name is Derek. So, dear, so it's Crest Derek, so Crest D. Um, that or D Crest. Remember the acronym for the rest of the uh, Same semester. Thing. Because we'll be focusing on that, and those are all the forces that apply and affect marketing. And we'll get into specifics. And today branding. we're going to talk about the most important one, uh, which is a D, which is me, um, which actually ties into demographics. And we'll talk about that. But first, I'll just quickly show you the pinwheel of all the uh, forces that we'll be doing uh, over the next uh, rest of the semester online. Which I and, just showed uh, you. But you'll back, see them again. We'll talk about uh, in specifics uh, certain things with regards to demographics. Okay. So here are the forces that we're going to be looking at on this pinwheel. Um, you can see they're demographic, competitive, technological, economic, one of my favorite ones. It's kind of crazy what's going on right now in the world. Uh, regulatory and social cultural ones. Um, we'll be talking more specifically as we get through uh, the rest of these videos. But today I want to focus on demographics. Now I'm guessing most of you have, have some inkling about demographics. You've heard about Generation X and Generation Y. And I want to take a few seconds now and think of anyone right now uh, or a demographic that is being affected by this COVID um, pandemic that's going on right now. So take two seconds and write it down. Okay. So if you said baby boomers, you would be right. Uh, obviously, baby boomers uh, are getting older and there's the ones that are getting affected more. Obviously, so we know there's more than just that, but when it first started, uh, demographics, uh, it's a little bit more about it got, was uh, the, the demographic that got hit the hardest. Comes from with regards to understanding it, it used to be really applicable uh, going back years when we looked at different marketing techniques. When we looked at, uh, we used to use TV. Not that we don't use it, but we're definitely fading away from it. Uh, newspapers, um, billboards, all those things that you probably don't watch uh, or see those advertisements anymore. You generally probably see them. Uh, your parents are probably generally the ones that get targeted um, on those uh, avenues with regards to the marketing. Um, but I want to talk a little bit more about um, specific issues with regards to demographics um, and the challenges that happen today, um, especially the tie into technological forces as well. But uh, we're going to focus on the demographics ones, okay? So let's look at baby boomers in a little more detail and kind of just understand what's happening with the Canadian population as there is a lot that's going on. Um, and I just want to quickly look at the stats. The stats we're looking at here are actually from 2006. So you can imagine how these numbers are probably escalated a little bit more. But if you look at these numbers, what do you conclude by looking at the stats where the population from 55 to 65 is almost over 25%? Right. If you said that a lot of the, most of the population is aging, that would be a, something that we as a marketing team would need to know that. Why? Because we want to market products to them. And if you think about who those people or are, our brands. they're more likely either older brothers or sisters, um, really older brothers and sisters, uh, your parents possibly, grandparents, uh, great-grandparents, all those could kind of fall into this category. So if you think about that, you got to need to, we need to know where are these people? Where do we find this demographic? Um, do we put them on social media? Because that's the first answer everyone goes to. Let's put them on social media. Well, if that's great. Um, but where on social media are they? Are they on uh, LinkedIn? Are they on Facebook? Are they on Twitter? YouTube. Are they on Snapchat? Where are they? So take two seconds now and write down where you think this demographic would be. It's not TikTok. If you said <laughs> Facebook, you would be correct. Um, now, that being said, it is changing a little bit more. You'll find me more and more, but I'm sure all of you I've had your parents, or you get that phone call, your grandparents asking you, hey, little Johnny, can you tell me I'm kind of like, how do I post photos of you when you're little on Facebook? Non-stop, right? right? Absolutely. So it's really un un important to understand that going today's, and actually they just announced that some um, companies, because of this COVID, are getting rid of the newsprint. So some of the flyers uh, from the grocery stores said, absolutely, that's it, we're done. Um, if you don't have uh, social media, or online, or a computer of some sort, or a mobile phone, a smartphone, um, unfortunately you won't get an advertisement for our store. Um, 
which really is a change. I think that's only in the urban area, now, so. Because at, at, currently at this time, what they've been doing, they've been balancing it, right? A little bit of social media, a little bit of um, online advertisement, and also newsprint in the local papers. So right now they said, that's it, we're done. Um, so I think you'll see more and more jump on that bandwagon, and that, that, that'll be it. So it'll be a big turning point um, as far as hard copy print uh, being used as a form of a marketing tool. Uh, in the future for a lot of businesses, okay? So let's look at more specifically, you know, more about your grandparents and your parents um, and why it's so important that we really want to market towards those. Because you may be like, oh, why would we want to do that? So let's look at that. So let's look a little further, like we mentioned. Uh, so the aging population, right? Your parents, I mean, everyone's aging, but the people that are getting up there. Um, and unfortunately, these are people being affected by uh, the virus going around. But let's look at that. So. People be 50 plus older control 75% of the Canadian household net worth. What does that mean? What does net worth mean? Um, how much right. money they have? So it's actual money that is in the household. So they are the ones in the household that have the money. Think of yourself. I'm sure you don't have thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars of disposable income that you can go out and buy new computers and lighting and all these social media tools that you need to be streaming online. You don't have that. Um, your parents, uh, your grandparents are the ones that have the money. So if you think about it, part of it is marketing companies want to address and market toward products towards people that have the money, right? It would be pointless to advertise to Brands, a demographic that doesn't have thing. a whole lot of income because they can't spend. So they add no value to the business. So understanding that this, that, and it's actually gone up quite a bit, um, it's important that we reach out to these people. Like I said, it's a big turning point now that they're getting rid of those hard copies. Uh, a print that everyone still um, gets those newspapers about, right? Um, actually, I saw it the other day that people were still, I saw a delivery boy going around handing out papers, yep. uh, delivering papers to houses, and I, it was crazy. I thought, really, during this time, uh, that they are, boys and girls are still doing that as a newspaper group, um, and it really isn't worth it. So, anyways, this is where the key point is. Um, addressing that if these guys are the, people, the demographic that has all the money, then we need to be looking at products, services um, that we could uh, target towards this demographic. Okay, oh. so let's look at them. Uh, some of the other uh, demographics or categories uh, that marketing companies have used. In this slide, uh, we talk about baby boomers. It's important to kind of help understand, you know, the age groups. So you see one member of the baby boomers, and we'll kind of keep that as a simple target because I think. Uh, that adds value um, to history and more understanding marketing and how it's worked over the years. Um, but it's definitely doing it about face, um, and we'll talk about that uh, in, in a few minutes. Um, but these, you remember, from remember the years. Um, if you look at the years, um, if you look real close, remember this. 1946 and 1964, the easy Might way to remember this is to just flip the numbers, right? Or 46, quiz. 64, 64, 46, 64, 46, right? So you'll remember that. Um, on a test, I don't know, call me crazy, it might show up on a test, that 1946 uh, goes to 1964 because the numbers are inverted, okay? So, when we're talking, I wanted to also start taking this moment to talk about uh, all the different categories. So, to make life easy for marketing companies, they came up and said, look, oh, you know, instead of saying, you know those people that live in the Toronto, oh, you know those people that live in Whippy, you know those people that live in Ajax, um, it became very hard uh, and confusing to people to understand, well, what does that mean? So what marketing companies did uh, years ago is they thought, you know, let's make it simple. Let's just categorize or profile certain groups of people so it makes it easier for us to kind of move forward from a marketing standpoint, which is fantastic, um, as long as it kind of makes sense. So we look at baby boomers from 1946, and you think about that for the most part, they're kind of the same. You know, they've worked at probably in their lifetime two, three, four jobs max. Um, very diverse, very loyal to brands, um, that sort of thing. Um, but the next few generations, I'm going to skip through real quick, Branding. Um, just to kind of give you an idea of uh, the other ones. I don't, and I don't want to talk about that because I want to move forward past it, uh, because I want to focus on marketing in the technological age of what we're facing these days. But there's a few others that we're going to bring up next. Okay? So here we have Generation X. Uh, we hear that all the time. Um, lots of people talking, blaming them about what's going on and everything else. Um, but yeah, Generation X, again... A marketing company has made it easier to kind of look at them and just a category uh, what age group they are. Okay, so here we have Generation Y, um, and they were born between 1978 to 1994. Oops. So I also want 75 to, to 91. That depending on what textbook you read, these numbers are going to change. 
plus or minus a couple of years. So just give right. it, don't hold it too much to the years exactly, uh, because depending on the books, the baby boomers and Generation X is pretty concrete as far as the years. Uh, but when you start reading into textbooks uh, and, and different online resources, you'll find these numbers will change a little bit. Um, again, basically just enforcing the fact that they're just guidelines uh, that marketing companies have used. Okay, so what do you think comes after Generation Y? And if you said Generation Z, you would be correct. Um, no. Again, so 1992 uh, to 2010, right? So again, marketing companies think almost a 20 year crazy. gap. So they're kind of figuring out, okay, what do we do with all these generations? Hmm. It's, it's so hard to market it to people because there's so many diverse uh, cultures coming into the uh, into the Canadian market. Um, this just is one avenue that we maybe would help us a little bit easier, help them find who Generation Z is um, and what needs and what they require. All right, so the last one we're going to talk about is millennials. And you guys kind of fall under that category, depending, again, on which marketing company uh, or what textbook you read. Um, but I think we're kind of, in, in my personal feeling, I think this is where we all are. And I think the days of categorizing um, demographics is kind of going to have to go by the wayside a little bit. And we'll explain that more uh, in the next couple of weeks. But anyways, um, what are some rumors? Take a few seconds. Uh, pause the video uh, and write down some of the rumors or when people hear of millennials, what comes to mind. All right. So take a second and do that. Hmm. Maybe they're not socially. All right. So lazy. If you use wrote down words like self entitled, lazy, can multitask, um, don't get outside enough, always on their computers, um, all right. the environment. You would be correct. Um, but those are some of the challenges that face when you start tying it in. Because if you notice, um, there are some years here, but it really, when you watch this video, um, which unfortunately I can't put on here because it doesn't. We're going to watch uh, it. We will watch it. Technologically wise right yet. Um, but if you go on D2L, there's a link to this video, which ties into the assignment. It's that not on your D2L. Um, so please watch the video. It's going to be in the next and, and comment slide on here. It. Um, and with regards to uh, the assignment, just you know, a short little paragraph explaining. Don't worry, there's no assignment for you guys right. with this all one. All right, so that's all the, the um, categories that I want to discuss. There are a couple others that, depending on which marketing company you look at or which textbooks you look at, um, that kind of can take it down to the next level. Um, but I don't want to focus too much on it because I think that's the challenge um, that a lot of marketing companies are going forward. They really use um, these categories um, to really help for their, um, their marketing strategy. Uh, and I think um, they're getting a little sidetracked now. I don't think you can wait so much onto uh, these categories as you did in the right. past. All right. That's the thing so let's outside look at the box now. Forces that tie into demographics. All right. Okay. So, so ethnic diversity. Yep. I think it's safe we'll to watch say the video that in a bit. around to Toronto or Ontario or across Canada, ethnic diversity drives our economy. Um, and it's really important to understand that. Why? Well, visible minorities make up 50% of the population in large urban areas like Toronto, Vancouver, Montreal. So it's important to understand that because we want to address or market products to um, this demographic. So how do we do that? How do you think we can kind of communicate to uh, hmm. this demographic? Well, if you look at things that are relatable, that are opening up, right? If you think about what types of foods are available at the grocery stores, right? You see these um, companies trying to get their attention uh, so that they feel more at home, regardless of when, uh, whatever country they may have immigrated from. Make the uh, connection. That it really makes them feel more at home uh, and, and buy their products and feel like they're a Canadian uh, once they get their citizenship and everything's all cool. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is an important factor. So I think it's important to understand when we do that, um, you got to address that in your products. Depending on what or your their brand values are, you need to make the association, right? Make that connection, um, which helps drive our economy. So it's important. You can't leave or ignore this because this is definitely something that's growing massively. I mean, if you look at the colleges now, the amount of uh, international students coming over uh, into Canada uh, at the college and at the university level is absolutely outstanding. Um, it's actually driving our economy, and it's fantastic to see that we have such a strong economy. And I think it'll help uh, get us through this. Uh, this little challenge of virus that we're going through right now. I agree. Hopefully we get through it really soon. But anyways, um, that's a huge thing to think about um, depending on your product or service that you're working on your current project. Okay. Okay. So last but not least, 
Uh, I want to talk about non-traditional families. Why, uh, first of all, does anyone recognize this video clip? Ooh. If you actually download the PowerPoint, you can actually watch the entire video ooh, clip. Ooh, ooh, ooh. If you know, know the name of this TV show. I know. I know. I know. I know it. Modern Family? Absolutely. Yes. I mean, it's been around for years. Many awards. Um, watch it last night. Think about Netflix. Why was it so successful? Take a second, pause the video, think about it, write down your favorite, why you think this video was so successful. It's sorry, that's the video, but this um, this TV show was so successful. Hmm, why was this successful? Good. So if you said that it could relate to everybody at different levels, yes. absolutely, right? Uh, people tend to watch things or do things that they can relate to, right? If you think about the things, videos that you watch on YouTube uh, or uh, things, uh, movies on Netflix, it shows and things that you can relate to. This was so successful because of what large demographic, it, it spread it all across Canada. Think of all the characters in this TV show, right? They all had some connection to someone, or you or someone tied into it in some way, right? I don't think there's one class I've sat through where not one person didn't uh, hasn't watched this show. Right. Uh, if you haven't watched it, I mean, it's not because it's, I think it's it's repeat. You should now. definitely watch it though. It's on Netflix this year. Um, but and you Prime. should absolutely watch it and it's, and it's really see the connection how marketing companies made it so successful. Um, and think um, that going forward, uh, it's really um, important to understand that. Touching on all the different cultures, uh, lifestyles uh, that are happening. It's in making the, world the connections. Canada, making the connections. It can't be ignored, and you need to address it accordingly. All right. So that's it for uh, demographic forces. Um, but we're going to watch the video. Shines your light a little bit more than it is just the typical age, gender, income, uh, all those that generally fall under that category. Right. Um, but it goes a lot deeper to really understand the importance of it. I mean, if you're looking at the forces that are going to apply to your product or service, or your 99 brand, 99.9999% of the forces, demographics is absolutely going to be one of them. Absolutely. Right? If you think about it, for sure, it has to be. So you need to understand them a little bit further. And I want you to rethink your project. Which one? Is so this, this is not the same project. This is a different project. Is generation X? Is it baby boomers? Is it millennials? Um, talk about the challenges. I, mean, I think a but lot your of personal brand. Are, you're looking think towards about it. millennials. Um, if not gender, baby boomers, like the, the, the spectrum, right? Everyone that's currently now, um, and baby boomers in Generation X, the past, but the middle is kind of, it's all kind of gray. But it's easy to focus on the extremes. But I want you to really think about, is it addressing all the issues and concerns that that demographic has um, that makes fun? All right, so good luck, and we'll see you next week. So I have... Uh... I forgot to mention at the beginning of the class, there are three quizzes uh, this week. Um, so what I would suggest, we're going to watch the next video here. After this video, um, you guys, what I would do um, is pause uh, the video, do the demographic quiz in week three, um, and then uh, watch the next section. So uh, after watch this video, I'll let you know that I would watch, uh, do the quiz. That way it's fresh in your mind. All right, let's watch this video on millennials. This is a uh, key and maybe hopefully strives the point um, about using these forces and not um, about Generation X and baby boomers and not relying so much on it, um, but also millennials here and why uh, it's a difficult to market towards um, to millennials. It seems like anyone who wants to make money is obsessed with the idea of marketing to millennials. The thing is, marketing to millennials is kind of dumb. Or very difficult. There are lots of reasons to take a hard look at the millennial marketing obsession. For one thing, we're really not that homogenous, and we also don't have that much money. But before you take to the comments section, hear me out. Defining millennials in any kind of meaningful way is difficult. Such respectable sources as Strauss and Howe and the U.S. Census Bureau are basing their numbers on very different age ranges, anywhere from 15-year age gap to a 25-year age gap. This means that reports from sources like the White House Council of Economic Advisors are forced to compare statistics using different age ranges. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, millennials make up one-third of the country. We're 83.1 million people and we're the largest generational group in the U.S. The eldest of us are in our early mid-30s and starting our careers, and the youngest of us are finishing up high school. You could be a millennial and have a millennial child. This group is also much more that. diverse than past generations. About 42% identify with a race or ethnicity other than non-Hispanic white, 
about twice the rate reported by baby boomers at this age. So in spite of the pervasive use of the term millennials in marketing, research, and writing, and the fact that pretty much everybody knows what it means, it's really not a particularly useful term for marketers. Right. One problem with millennial marketing strategy is that numbers are often tossed around without a lot of context. For example, millennials contribute $200 billion in annual spending to the U.S. economy, and that seems like a lot until you compare it to the $2 trillion that baby boomers contribute and the $736 billion that Gen X contributes. Yes, our relative buying power is going to grow as we age, but that's where we are right now. Millennials are perceived as a much stronger economic segment than we currently are. Even though we're the most educated generation in U.S. history, inflation-adjusted median income has actually decreased since 1980 by about $3,500 a year. Our parents were and are able to accumulate wealth much more readily than we are. Our net worth is just 43% of the Gen X peak in 1995. We're more likely to be underemployed, unemployed, and to live in poverty. That sounds really dismal, but the actual numbers are beside the point, for marketers at least. Perception is what influences spending anyway, and millennials are having a tough time there, too. 80% of employees under 30 say they expect to be much worse off in retirement than their parents are. Things like stagnant incomes, uh, lack of benefits at work, difficulty ret contributing to retirement plans, and student debt uh, are influencing millennials' major life choices. We're waiting longer to get married, buy houses, have kids. And these economic choices are intimately related to marketers' goals. It's true that the eldest millennials are currently in the early stages of our careers and will be extremely important to the economy long term. But right now, we aren't the most lucrative demographic by pretty much any metric. And yet, marketers spend 500% more on millennials than on any other generation. I get it. Young people represent the chance to build a long-term relationship with high lifetime value. But the thing is, it isn't just Macy's versus Gimbel's anymore. The market offers exponentially more options, and it operates in a Amazon. fundamentally different way. That's why the idea of the millennial has been such a useful tool in navigating this radically different economy. It's centered on buzzwords like mobile, social, authenticity, connectedness, and social justice. Millennial marketing has become shorthand for these and other changes that have taken place over the last few decades. At best, this leads to great marketing, but much of the time it can be simplistic and sometimes condescending and often totally misses the point. Listen to this quote from a New York Times article about marketing to millennials. Some brands, for instance, are trying to figure out how to use emojis, a pictograph-based language of happy faces and hearts that is important to millennials. That same article quotes Matt Britton saying, Brands need to re-engineer how they reach millennials. Brands need to figure out how to add value to a consumer's life. And if they do that, consumers will seek brands out. Experiential now marketing. that's true, but not for or because of millennials. That's simply how marketers need to behave in an era of transparency and choice in which consumers can go out at any time and find an option that better fits their needs and adds value to their lives. Researching this video, I read an article that said that millennials are more empathetic because we use social media and are more exposed to different experiences and perspectives. Now, while there are a lot of problems with that statement, including the very real social media echo chamber effect, the most germane one is that it's the social media use and not the age of the user that is most relevant. And while millennials did drive the early growth of social media, it has gone global. It's easy to fall into the trap of using youth as a proxy for innovation, but you can be just as innovative marketing to a 70-year-old grandmother as you can to a 17-year-old high school student. And grandma's Bingo. don't want the money anyway. Bingo. So am I just saying that any categories are worthless because humans are special snowflakes and we're all unique, so marketers should only focus on one-to-one -one marketing? No. I'm just saying that the unique value that we have to offer as marketers for our brands is more specific than anything that could appeal to 80 million people, and that we'll get better ROI by focusing on that unique value. Regardless of whether you're marketing to millennials or boomers, the process is the same. Decide who your ideal customer is, and learn everything you can about them from your own real-life data and experiences, and really listen to what kind of experiences they want to have, and then give them that. Millennials are often referred to as digital natives, and that much is true. But while we are concurrent with this change, and it's happening at a time of our lives that we're particularly open to it, it doesn't belong to us. Millennials spend 41% of our media time on our mobile devices, but 35 to 54-year-olds spend 34% of their time, and that's only seven points lower. Even the 55-plus crowd is spending 16% of their media time on mobile devices. Our digital fluency may make us early adopters especially of free technologies, I would note, but we're certainly not the only ones, and we may not be the most lucrative. My mom recently sent me an Airbnb listing she liked, and I hadn't even downloaded the app yet. 
Meanwhile, my boyfriend's parents prefer not to have the internet at their house. Things are not that simple. Airbnb actually does an amazing job of marketing to their exact niche, and they've scooped up a lot of non-millennials like my mom as a result. But a lot of brands find it easier to use the millennial shorthand, and I empathize with them for all the reasons why. Things are moving really quickly, and the threat of getting left behind looms large. But you can avoid the overwhelm by focusing on the root of the matter, what your ideal customer needs and wants from your brand. And that probably right doesn't there. sound revolutionary to you, so why aren't more brands doing it? Right. Probably because it's a lot harder to figure out who really wants your product and why and to yes. back it up with research than it is to start on Instagram because that's what millennials want. And on that note, I'm an Instagram man. Okay, so that's a good little video. Um, you can follow uh, follow her as well. Um, yeah, I mean, really, at the end of the day, if you look at the key takeaway from that video, I mean, is the age gap is trying to market to millennial when you have such an age gap where you can be uh, have, be a millennial adult or parent and have a millennial, millennial child by their definition, right? So you're questioning, you know, how much weight do you really put on that uh, title uh, or that category labeling um, a certain age group, a millennial? Uh Okay, so what I would do now, uh, if you guys would want, I would pause the video and go do the demographic quiz. So go ahead and do that now. Great, glad you're back. Hope you did well on the quiz. Uh, let's go on to the next force, competitive forces. And again, it's another video I have of myself. It's not as long as a demographic one, um, but it's a good, uh, um, Good video and touches on the points. Again, you can watch all these videos on my YouTube channel. But here we go. And then just so you know, there will be a quiz uh, after this one. So pay attention. Two categories um, of competition that we're going to look at. We're going to look at indirect versus direct uh, and what the difference is. All right, so let's do that now. So the first one we're going to look at is direct competition. Um, direct competitions are companies that are identical, uh, very similar, very, very, very similar. So they're almost identical. I mean, obviously there are going to be a few little changes, but they're almost identical. So a perfect example would be what would be a direct competition for, say, McDonald's? Burger King, said Burger King yes. Wendy's, Harvey's, absolutely, yes. right? You basically walk in, there's an area to sit and eat your burgers, fries, very, the layers are very similar. Yes, the colors are a little bit different, but they're almost identical when you walk into the stores, right? Um, think about Pizza Pizza. What would be some perfect comp or sorry, direct competition for Pizza Pizza? Right? Yeah, Domo? you said uh, Little Caesars. Borderline, they're changing up a little bit. Mm. Um, but uh, Domino's, very similar, right? Great Fast pizza. So they would be direct competition, right? You think about if you're thinking about you want to order pizza, you really have a, a few options to choose from, right? But they'd be the process is the same. So in this case, I want you to think about who's direct competition for Home Depot. Remember, you're looking at companies that are identical. This company that I'm thinking of uh, is very, very identical. It's almost mm. spin images as far as the blueprint of the store. Home hardware. Uh, the color is just a no. Canadian Tire. You would be correct, right? So if you walk into these two stores, um, they're identical. The layout is the exact same. The lumber the, is one side of the store. Their seasonal electronics and paint are in the exact same locations. Um, they're spitting images almost of each other. The only real big difference are the colors, right? One's orange and the other one's blue. All right. So now let's look at indirect competition. So indirect competition Ooh, gets uh, really challenging. This is what some competitors like. We talked yes. about monopolistic competition. It kind of falls into this category. So you look at we didn't talk about monopolistic. Don't worry about Nike it. T-shirt. I keep going on that example for now. Right? There's many places I can buy a white Nike T-shirt. Right? If you start thinking of it, there's Sport Check, obviously. Um, there's all other places. Right? You can buy them at possibly real Canadian superstore. Um, you can possibly buy them. Um, uh, national sports, which is also ironic. Possible. So, by sport check, so it kind of falls into that monopoly category that we are talking about before, right? Um, so think about indirect competition. So I want you to think about who's in indirect competition for uh, Pizza Pizza. 
think about it for a minute. Mm. Think about where else can you get a pizza other than those fast food places. Mm. Right. If you said uh, real Canadian superstore, yes. you'd be absolutely right. Right. People forget frozen, frozen pizzas, pizzas. Right. That's right. why if you look at the price of frozen pizzas in the grocery store, they're five dollars, four ninety nine is that magical price. And what price can you get a pizza for a pizza pizza? During the promo, five dollars. I think the price is slowly creeping up now, but at around that five six dollar price range, they're almost identical, right? So they're absolutely direct competition, right? So think about that. So the same thing when you're looking at um, uh, electronics, right? TVs. Where can you buy a TV? Um, so yeah, if you're looking at a 48 inch TV, we used that example before, where can you buy one? You can buy one at Best Buy, right. uh, but where else can you buy one? Again, real Canadian superstore, Costco, Walmart, right? Not the exact same layouts, but you can buy very similar product, right? Remember we talked not about identical. Not probably identical. In some cases you might be able to find the, the odd one. Um, but for the most part, um, they're not identical, right? So they're indirect competition. It's like paint. You can buy paint where? Home Depot, you can also buy paint at Walmart. If you look at most of these indirect competitors, 99% of the time, they're going to be the big guys. Right. Right? They're going to be the Walmarts of the world. Because think about where you can buy everything, right? Costco, Walmart, Real Canadian Superstore, all these. And this is why they've done so well and why they have the biggest Canadian threat tire. in retail is because they're a one-stop shop, right? Where else can you buy uh, strawberries? Well, you can buy them at Costco. Right? You can buy them at the local fruit stand. You can buy them at uh, Sobeys, right? The layouts of those three are not even close to each other, but they have the exact same product. And right. that's what you need to keep in mind. Um, a lot of companies forget that and actually look at the indirect competition. People that actually carry similar products and can still compete with them. And it gets really uh, challenging at some time because there's so much competitor, especially now when you're looking at online. Online throws this way off the radar. Um, it becomes very, very challenging. So for this example, um, what would be a direct competitor for sport check? Yeah, I mean, most of you would be thinking about it. You think right away, you say national sports, uh, but I think I just told you uh, that um, they're actually owned by the same company, so technically they're not. Owned by Canadian Tire. Uh, a uh, direct competition, indirect, uh, could be uh, played against sports. Uh, the layouts are a lot smaller, so not really, so they could be that category. But an obvious one, where else can you buy sporting equipment? Real Cage and Superstore. Right, they have very similar you can Costco, buy shoes there. Um, not Walmart. identical, but remember, if we're looking for a white T-shirt, maybe even a white Nike T-shirt, Real Canadian Superstore might carry that exact same stuff. So they're indirect right. competition from each other. All right, so let's not get those two mixed up. So remember, we're talking about the uh, four types and the Don't two categories. Don't worry about the four types. Just right? worry about the two categories. So there's a assignment for you guys to work on. No assignment. There is a quiz uh, that I have for you guys. So you guys, if you guys can pause the the video now uh, and do um, quiz uh, number three, competitive forces. Um, and then once you're back, you continue on with the video. Okay. All right, let's move on. So the last one is regulatory forces and I have a video in a video here as well. Um, so here we go. And there will be a quiz after this one as well. And then we're almost done. Hey, welcome back. Really uh, so short we're hair. We're almost done all <laughs> of our environmental forces that we've been looking at. The last one we're going to look at uh, today. Not the last. This is um, number third. Is regulatory forces, and we're going to discuss those. And there's going to be a video that we're going to go through together. And uh, I thought as well, for those that would like and they're there wanting is. something else to do and maybe want some more marks, um, I'm going to throw a bonus assignment. We're not going to uh, do a bonus assignment. Of, uh, at the end of this uh, video. Um, you have a quiz at the end of this video. Uh, and submit a, a quick little blurb and uh, get some bonus marks. Uh, why not, right? Okay. Uh, also, don't forget, if you want still, is to click and subscribe. Uh, in the video, make Self sure you get a little notification bell, um, <laughs> and we'll get going. All right. So the last one, regulatory forces. What is that? Well, when we're compared to marketing, it's 
and brands. Uh, the rules, the laws, all the regulations that are out there so that everyone plays fair, right? It's this big, massive, competitive sandbox, as we did uh, in the last video. We talked about all the competitive forces that are out there. Um, these are just kind of some regulations out there to kind of make sure that everyone's playing Ver fairly. Copyrights. Because it is so competitive and there's lots of money um, that can be traded hands in, in this scenario. All relations So let's to start looking at some of these uh, regulatory forces and companies that are out there now. Okay. So these also so relate these to brands. There are only a few of the companies uh, listed. There are many others, but these are just a few that kind of um, probably affect you directly. Um, so let's look at the first one. So the do not, uh, sorry, the Competition Bureau. The Competition Bureau, uh, remember we talked about it when we talked about the competition forces, um, talk about uh, and regulate to make sure everyone's playing fairly. There are some rules as far as uh, prices, um, merchandising standards, um, some perfect examples that might happen if you walk into a store, if you were to go into, say, Sport Check um, or Winners uh, and some other uh, big retailers like that, you would notice when something is on sale, um, they use certain you know words like was uh, and now. So it was $99.99, but it's now $49.99. So there are some rules saying that, and some companies got dinged in the past um, saying that when you type in the was, it actually has to be sold at that price for a certain period of time. Got to um, play fair. And some companies can get fined dramatic amounts of money um, they have. if they don't follow these rules. YouTube it. Um, or not so YouTube, some Google companies it. have actually gotten around that. Uh, and winners is a perfect example of that, um, where they use the wording. They don't say was. If anyone know what that what they say in the, in the, on the tag? Ooh, I do. It doesn't say was it's or regular a, price. It says it, now. Right. It says compare at. Oh, right. And right. they get around compare that, at. so they can uh. compare. So when you read the sales tag on the sticker, it says compare at ninety nine ninety nine. Right. Our price. Forty nine nine nine. Right. So it's kind of yeah. Technically, it's not saying the was and now. Um, but it kind of gives you a value. The tricky part sometimes, though, is good luck trying to find it ever uh, at right. that compare at price, right? right? The compare at price that they're always referring to is the manufacturer's suggested list price that um, manufacturers will send to the retailer saying, here, this is what we recommend that you sell it at. So it gives you a sense of value, right? I remember you think when something's you buy something that's on sale, is you're buying it because you think it's there's a good value to it, right? <clears throat> so that's some of the things they regulate. Um, lots of other uh, issues with regards to tags on the uh, products um, uh, and so forth. So there's a whole uh, website dedication to the Competition Bureau. Um, many, but many the price pages. tag is one is is one that's quite common. Um, another one um, is again with pricing um, is the um, clearance tags. Bait and switch uh, you can't, is another it's called one. Double ticketing standard. You can't just keep putting prices up and down, up and down, over top of each other. You have to remove that. Um, if not, they have to give it to you uh, for that price, or Hard they to can police, be fined, etc., so. etc. Et now, that being said, uh, retailers are allowed to make mistakes. So if you do see something, you walk into a store. Um, they can actually make that change and correct it. They don't have to sell to you for at that price. Right. So these are just a few of the things the Competition Bureau looks at um, in certain retailers. Many others. Though. So let's talk about uh, next one. You guys might hear this one all the time, the Better Business Bureau. Um, this company works on the ethics, make sure it's following you know, legal within the, the realms of legally what makes sense and what's fair for everybody. Um, they just kind of work more on the ethics versus competition where it works more on the rules. Um, but the Better Business Bureau um, is another one that's out there. Um, the Do Not Call List, um, this is something that has kind of fallen off the radar. It's still, still happening, there. actually. It's um, back on the yeah, radar. I may, st may still get them. They actually were just ramping up. I noticed it the other day um, that I started getting some phone calls. And the biggest one was air duct cleaning. It yes. um, was back uh, a few years ago um, where you'd get these random phone calls saying, hey, we can clean your air ducts. And if you trace the number, some number in California, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so what is the do not call list? The do not call list, uh, apparently, uh, well, it is, it's not apparently, but apparently when you put Oops. your name on it, you say, someone calls you up, say, hey, we do say thanks, but no thanks. Um, can you put me on the do not call list? Um, and then they're supposed to put you on the list and you're not supposed to receive any calls. The Bell problem, Canada the challenges got fined. The face is how to regulate that. And actually Two Bell Canada oh, uh, got dinged quite a bit. I forgot I mentioned it. 
uh, quite a few years ago um, for multi millions of dollars um, for that. Um, if you look up and Google it, Bell uh, do not call list, fine. Um, you can read all about that. Um, but it's basically just again to keep it fair, right? So that you're not telemarketers aren't pounding the consumer over and over and over um, with these, you know. Uh, false and fraud claims out there. So the do not call us is out there, but the challenge with all of these actually is regulating them. And there is a ton of companies uh, out there that break these on a daily basis for mostly, honestly, is more for ignorance. They're just not familiar with all the rules that are out there. Um, and the only way they they would get caught is if someone or another company would call them out on it. Okay. And the last one I want to talk about, and this is one down here, uh, is quite common right now. It's called the uh, the CRTC or the Radio, uh, oops, sorry, the Canadian Radio and Television Commission. Um, this company basically regulates what's on television and what you hear on the radio, right? Um, if you guys can remember when you're younger, certain shows were on at certain times and certain shows were not on at certain times, right? Simpsons is the one that comes to mind. Um, when it first came out, I believe it had to be on after eight, and then it became seven and it became six and so forth and so forth and so forth um, because it was very controversial, uh, the content that was on The Simpsons. The, radio, the CRTC is that company that regulates that, what you see and what you hear at certain times and what can be said. Um, as far as nudity, language, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's changed. I mean, if you go back 20 years and you look at what TV shows were then versus content versus what no TV question. shows now, even movies, um, there's a huge difference. <clears throat> so the CRTC uh, basically does that. But the next thing I want to talk about is when you think about what, um, uh, how would we watch movies nowadays? We don't watch them on television. Yes, we some of us still have our Rogers boxes and our Bell boxes, and we still have uh, cable, um, but we're getting away from that. And if you think about, and we talked about this in technological forces, uh, how we watch movies and everything now is we stream, right? Which uses what um, uh, avenue to communicate to us, right? They use the internet. And here's the challenge: um, who controls the internet? Right? Nobody. Nobody. This gets the CRTC kind of upset a little bit, saying, well, how can we regulate that, right? They're trying to do their job, um, and now everyone's over here uh, watching movies um, and sub uploading and downloading. That's not uh, regulated. And they have no control over it. And this is getting really kind of dicey now, and there's a whole controversy that's been stirring and stewing in the past seven years, and it's kind of ramping up more and more now that more and more of us are streaming. So that's what the CRTC does, and uh, we're going to watch a quick video. Um, that's a good video. One of my favorites. It's about an eight-minute video, um, and it's a good one. That's, it's a couple years old, um, but it really shows the frustration that the CRTC is having. You'll see the videos. It's quite humorous. It's one of my favorite videos um, that they're struggling with um, in trying to control the Internet. Um, and it brings up a lot of interesting discussions about our economy, uh, what we should do, um, what's right versus wrong. You know, do you feel violated? Should do you feel comfortable being told what you can and cannot watch on YouTube? Can you do you feel you should watch whatever you want? Um, you know, where are we? It's just it's a real ethical question right now, uh, and it's still. It's a very delicate topic um, because there's always m money underlying issues with it. So, anyways, watch the video. Uh, let's watch this quick video. Uh, keep a reminder there is a bonus assignment. There's no bonus assignment left for those that want to do. It's at the end of the uh, video, um, and I also posted no under bonus assignment. The, uh, the Dropbox under assignments. And there we'll will be a quiz. Out. All right, all right. Okay, here's the Netflix video. Um, we're gonna play it in full screen. Thought it'd be a little bit easier. It was just me voiceover. Um, so if you have headphones and that, plug them in. It's only about eight minutes long. And we'll I don't think there. it's eight minutes long. Okay, guys. So here's a quick little video. We're going to go through this uh, together. Uh, I'm going to pause it and start as we go. Um, it's from a few years ago, but it's uh, something that was interesting um, when everyone was upset about Netflix Canada versus Netflix U.S., um, and then some of the shows you're watching. So this will help maybe shed some light on it. Um, but it also addresses um, a very interesting topic as far as internet and streaming 
challenges now and the rules that kind of fall around it and understanding why certain things are the way they are and what's happening out there in the world of streaming uh, services, um, Netflix, Disney, Amazon, um, and, and YouTube actually, and they all kind of play a role. So we're going to go through this video. Um, and at the end of the video, I will, uh, give you a bonus assignment. So no bonus those assignment. Those that want to do a, a little <laughs> few extra marks. We're going to do a quiz. Uh, I will make this a bonus Last assignment quiz. at the end of the video. Okay, so here we go. Teen years here in Canada for just four years, and it dominates internet data usage. About 40% of primetime streaming in Canada is Netflix, yet it is unregulated and pays no Canadian tax. And that, as Jacques Bourbeau reports, led to some tense moments today at a CRTC hearing. It's a hit with Canadian viewers, not so much with some Canadian broadcasters. They complain Netflix is not regulated, files no taxes, and doesn't pay into funds to produce Canadian programs. But Netflix says it does do its part. We've pro Okay, so let's understand now. So they pay no tax. Why is that? Because their office is in the States. So for those at home that pay the monthly fee for Netflix, you're paying that fee, it's to a company in the States. So what, from economists, is why they get upset is that here in Canada, you have your money and you're spending it elsewhere. Bingo. And Netflix is able to access that market free of charge. And the CRTC is saying, whoa, 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 you should be keeping money in Canada so that it's better for our economy. And that's kind of what they're looking at here now. And I'll discuss some other things that Netflix, since this video, has changed a few things. Okay. Actively licensed Canadian content, not because anybody told us to, but because we thought our members would enjoy it. The CRTC wants numbers to back up that claim. So it asked Netflix about subscriber numbers, revenue, Pop. how much it spends on Canadian programs. Information Netflix is reluctant to give up. We are just ensuring, because of the sensitivity of the information, that confidentiality can be guaranteed. This infuriated the chair of the CRTC. You coming here and suggesting that we don't treat information confidentially is actually a bit offensive. The CRTC chair got so That's fed up, he called for a break and stormed out of the hearing room. Okay, so what just happened? So, Nef CRTC is asking for Netflix to uh, share all their information. With that um, Netflix is... Are you kidding me? Why would we do that? Just because you have no power over us, and why would we do that? Um, so that just infuriated um, the CRTC, uh, and hence him walking out, which is really kind of ironic because you know there's kind of like the the young child stamping his feet because they're not getting their way, and Netflix is like, we we don't abide by your laws and rules. So it's really kind of interesting if you look at it going forward down the road, down the road, what are is the rule of the CRTC. And I think that's cool. kind of where it's coming from where, you know, and you also think about how does Netflix come to Canada? Well, it's through the internet. Well, then that gets up a whole open discussion as to well, who regulates the internet. And right now, nobody, not rightfully so should they, it opens up a whole realm of questions. So anyways, uh, let's continue to watch the video. When he got back, Blay laid down the law. You operate under an exemption order that requires you to provide information. You are not entitled to a special treatment. We are treating you like every other applicant. At these hearings, numerous voices have demanded that if Netflix wants access to the Canadian market, it should give something back. It's clear that Netflix is a player in the Canadian system, and Canadians want Netflix to make a contribution back to Canada. But the Conservative government says that's not going to happen, saying it will not tax the internet. We have no intention of, of raising costs on consumers uh, and, and putting any kind of a video or YouTube or Netflix tax in place. Critics say the government should not be telling the CRTC what to do. The CRTC is a quasi-independent uh, regulator. It is supposed to exist at arm's length. Uh, and the government is not supposed to operate in its uh, or intervene in its day-to-day -day affairs. It may have endured a rough ride at today's hearing, but Netflix executives walked away knowing they've won the more important battle, avoiding any kind of internet tax in Canada. So that's exactly what was discussed: is in how to generate income back and keep it into Canada. Now, since this video, 
Uh, Netflix has actually opened up offices um, across Canada. Um, so they actually employ. So there actually is a... Just as an update, they actually have just opened up in Toronto. Uh, they've agreed to do this, a major head office. They've had ones open in Montreal, BC, and Winnipeg, uh, temporary ones, but they just announced uh, just recently that they're going to open up a Toronto one. So uh, I'm going to end it there with the uh, regulatory forces. Um, so what I would suggest to you guys now is go ahead and... Uh, you can finish, I would finish the regulatory uh, quiz, get that done. So those are your three quizzes you should have completed during this video. So demographic, competitive, and regulatory. Mm. Go over the week six checklist for the quad semester uh, that we're in, uh, and then finish working on major assignment number one. So very busy week, but these quizzes are in and should be done relatively quick. They're not big, they're just short and sweet. Um, and then work on getting your major assignment for assignment number one completed. Uh, and look at the due date. All right, guys, and I will see you uh, next video, and stay safe.